Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror TV series named Fringe Season 5. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama kicks off with Olivia and Peter having a child named Henrietta. One day, while the family of three is playing in the park, a building suddenly vanishes. Then, a group of observers appear out of nowhere and launch a terrifying invasion. Amidst the chaos, Henrietta's whereabouts become unknown. The scene shifts to the year 2035. It turns out what we just saw was Peter's dream, which is also a memory from a few months prior. Continuing with the plot in 2035, Henrietta rescues Dr. Walter and others from Amber, leading to a heartfelt reunion with her father Peter. She cherishes a necklace made from a bullet, which seems to hold special significance. The group decides to extract Agent Olivia from the Amber. Dr. Walter mentions that when Olivia disappeared, she had called him from somewhere near Central Park in New York. Dr. Walter reveals that Olivia had a critical device, the pheromone aggregator, which is the first step in initiating the plan to resist the observers. We know from the end of Season 4 that September came to Dr. Walter to warn about the impending observer invasion. Touched by their human love, September decides to help them. Over the years leading up to the invasion, Dr. Walter and September devise a detailed plan to resist the observers. To prevent the observers from discovering it, September encodes the plan in pheromones, scrambles it, and stores it in Dr. Walter's brain. The pheromone aggregator can reassemble and extract this plan from Dr. Walter's mind. Upon arriving at Central Park in New York, they find the park gone, transformed by the observers into a massive device. Henrietta explains that this device is designed to release carbon monoxide into the atmosphere because the air on Earth, with its high oxygen content, is unsuitable for the observer's survival. If this continues, it will spell doom for humanity. Since Olivia suddenly disappeared, it's likely she saw something amiss and encased herself in amber. They start searching the nearby amber but find that the area has been stripped clean. Henrietta comments that they have run into amber traffickers. Having spent so much time in the fringe division, Henrietta is well versed in dealing with both sides of the law. They trade a few walnuts to learn Olivia's whereabouts, which turns out to be in the possession of a bookstore owner who was smitten with her at first sight. After retrieving Olivia's amber, they are discovered by the observers, leading to a fierce fight during which Dr. Walter is captured. They manage to rescue Olivia from the Amber, and the family is reunited once again. Olivia finds it hard to believe. In her memory, Henrietta was only three years old, and now she's suddenly 25, almost her own age, which feels very odd. Olivia pulls out the pheromone aggregator from her pocket, but it doesn't seem to react at all. In another scene, Dr. Walter's whereabouts are unknown after his capture. Henrietta turns to her trusted colleague, a tech expert, asking for assistance. Meanwhile, Peter seeks out Olivia. It turns out the couple separated after their daughter Henrietta went missing. Peter wanted to continue the search for her, while Olivia, believing Henrietta to be dead, chose not to and instead went to the battlegrounds in New York. Their differing views ultimately led to their divorce. Meanwhile, the bald leader of the Observers was interrogating Dr. Walter, torturing him with telekinetic powers. However, September had previously tampered with Dr. Walter's thoughts, so the leader couldn't extract anything useful. With the help of Henrietta's colleague, they locate Dr. Walter via surveillance. The location where Dr. Walter is held is under observer control, a place no ordinary person could access. They employ high-tech gadgets to feign death, deceiving the followers into believing they are transferring bodies, which allows them to gain entry successfully. Inside, Peter shuts down the air control system, causing the leader to struggle for breath and seek carbon monoxide instead. Olivia and Peter manage to rescue Dr. Walter and hand him the pheromone aggregator. The device starts to light up, indicating that only Dr. Walter can activate it. He puts it on his head and starts rambling incoherently. Due to the torture from the observer leader, Dr. Walter has forgotten much, including why Dr. Bell's hand needed to be cut off. Olivia suggests that, based on his past habits, Dr. Walter would have recorded the information they need. They decide to return to his lab at Harvard University, but find it now occupied by the observers, so they resort to entering through the underground steam tunnels. Once inside, they discover that half of the lab is encased in amber, clearly Dr. Walter's doing. They find a video recorder within the amber, possibly containing important information. Suddenly, a follower with tattoos barges in, but they quickly subdue him. They plan to extract the recorder with a laser, but the lab's power system is down. The switch is in the campus's tech building, whose status is unknown. Henrietta interrogates the tattooed follower, using a device that can age a person by several years instantly. Despite the extreme measure, he remains silent. 
Then, unexpectedly, a bird flies in, a rare sight in a future where even walnuts and apples are scarce. Olivia approaches the tattooed follower, surmising that he didn't come because he discovered them, but to feed the bird. It seems this follower isn't all bad. After some gentle persuasion, he agrees to share what he knows on one condition. Olivia must tell his son that he won't be coming back, as no follower captured by the resistance ever returns alive. Olivia agrees. The tattooed man admits he's never been inside the tech building and doesn't know the situation there, but provides them with the entry code and mentions they'll need his iris. Hearing that, Dr. Walter devises a solution. Using high-tech equipment, he replicates the man's iris onto a pig's eye. At the same time, Peter and Henrietta painted fake codes on their faces to disguise themselves and infiltrate the tech building. After entering the password and scanning the iris, they gained access to the electrical switch room. Unexpectedly, Henrietta spotted observers excavating Agent Simon from the amber and decapitating him for research. Henrietta raised her gun to act, but Peter calmed her down. Peter and Henrietta successfully restored power to the lab, where Dr. Walter used a laser to retrieve the video recorder. Meanwhile, Henrietta, who initially planned to kill the tattooed man to cover their tracks, hesitated and ultimately let him go. The tattooed man had a sudden realization and decided to join the resistance against the observers. Inside the lab, they played the videotape. Dr. Walter rambled in the video saying bullshit things like, you are the warriors chosen by heaven, and you are the only hope for human civilization. After his speech, he sealed up the video recorder. Then they discovered another box of videotapes in the amber. Upon playing one, they saw Dr. Walter congratulating them for finding tape number three and explaining that they had to find the rest of the tapes in order to uncover the plan to defeat the observers. Peter asked him if he was missing a screw in his head because he should have put tape number one at the beginning. With only this tape available, they decided to watch it. The video mentioned coordinates, but then it got stuck. They had no choice but to drive to those coordinates. They arrived at a forest with seemingly nothing there. Suddenly, they were surrounded by several people with black spots on their faces. The bespectacled leader recognized Dr. Walter at once, as since the observer's invasion, part of the population had escaped here to eke out a living. In their spare time, they decided to document history. So, naturally, Dr. Walter, as one of the first notable rebels, was well-documented and revered. Dr. Walter asked about the black spots on their faces, which looked like mold. The bespectacled leader said he didn't know. After staying here for a while, the spots just appeared. Dr. Walter inquired if they were hiding something important, but the bespectacled leader knew nothing about it. At the lab, Astrid repaired the videotape. It turns out that Dr. Walter mentioned a type of crystal ore here that they needed to mine and bring back. The leader with glasses confirmed there indeed was a mine, but it had been abandoned a long time ago. Upon reaching the mine, they pulled out a body. Dr. Walter examined it and identified the source of the mold. It seemed dangerous to go down there carelessly, as one could die covered in spots. After a thorough examination of the body's spots, Dr. Walter discovered they were not mold, but a natural immune response to the highly acidic air in the mine, which caused the skin to react. At that moment, Olivia noticed that Dr. Walter and she herself had begun to show spots. Dr. Walter quickly treated them, relieved that the spots had not yet penetrated the dermal layer, but they needed to hurry with the mining. Otherwise, they would be too disfigured to face anyone. Dr. Walter decided to make a protective suit, but needed time. Henrietta then shared the bad news with everyone. A spy they had planted with the observers reported that the followers had discovered their location and were on their way. Astrid further repaired the tape. In the video, Dr. Walter said the crystal was a powerful energy source, and the exact refining method was on tape number 6 to number 9, which he couldn't remember. The protective suit still needed copper to be completed. Time was running out, and the bespectacled leader decided to sacrifice himself. Without telling anyone, he jumped into the mine and brought up the crystal, dying in the process. Throughout history, in any war of resistance against foreign invasion, these kinds of self-sacrificing unsung heroes are truly great and deserve to be remembered by history, even if it's just with an unmarked grave. The group had obtained the crystal, but the road to revolution was long and arduous. The scene shifts to Peter going alone to a grocery store to buy a chain. It turns out that Henrietta's necklace had been melted down by Dr. Walter and used in the laser, but Peter encountered a patrol of observers. Since Peter couldn't hide his thoughts, the observers sensed something was wrong and sent people to chase him. 
In the end, Peter was knocked unconscious by an explosion and didn't wake up until the next day. He returned to the lab through the underground tunnels, feeling depressed, and found that everyone had dug up another videotape. The digging was slow because they were afraid the laser might burn the tape. Peter shared his encounter with the observers, and Henrietta said she would teach him how to hide his thoughts another day. Peter agreed and joked that he would have to pay tuition, then gave the new necklace he had bought to Henrietta. At that moment, the observer leader found Philip and showed him surveillance footage from the grocery store. He doubted whether Philip would betray them since he and this Peter were old acquaintances. Philip replied that he should have trust in him because he could read his mind. In the lab, everyone watched the new videotape, which was number two. Dr. Walter mentioned he had hidden a canister at a subway station as part of the plan and they needed to retrieve it. However, the subway station was not easy to enter as it was occupied by the observers. Dr. Walter led everyone to the lab cellar. Astrid exclaimed that it was unbelievable. He had been in the lab for so many years and never knew there was a cellar. Dr. Walter revealed that it was his own secret base where he had hidden all the black tech used in previous paranormal events, meaning the cellar was essentially an arsenal filled with black technology. On the other side, the observers have apprehended Henrietta's spy embedded deep within enemy territory. Through a mind-reading interrogation, they've extracted two pieces of intelligence. Firstly, there's another mole known as Pigeon within the observer's own ranks. Secondly, they suspect that Dr. Walter and others are holed up in a lab at Harvard University. Upon hearing this, Philip is visibly tense, and for good reason, as he is the mole codenamed Pigeon. Elsewhere, Henrietta finds Olivia and tells her that the bullet found in her makeup box must hold significant importance, so she's returning it. It turns out that this bullet is the same one that Dr. Walter had once fired into Olivia's head. Olivia reflects that over the years, she left her daughter nothing, but this bullet could be the one to save the world, and insists Henrietta should keep it. Just then, Philip sends a message to Henrietta, alerting her that the observers are onto the lab and they need to evacuate post-haste. Dr. Walter argues that there are still tapes to be unearthed. They can't leave now. Peter objects, pointing out that if the observers come, they'll undoubtedly seal off the location, preventing any future entry. In a stroke of inspiration, Olivia suggests Dr. Walter reseal the lab in amber, making it appear as if no one has ever been there. Sure enough, when the observers enter the lab and find no traces of recent activity, they move on. The observer leader remarks on the craftiness of humans, now capable of concealing their thoughts. Philip denies the possibility, but the leader counters that Henrietta could hide her thoughts, and perhaps she's not the only one with that ability. Dr. Walter and the others plan to retrieve a tube of drawings from the subway station. During the security check, Dr. Walter utilized a poison gas grenade, which is potent enough to seal all seven orifices of a person. He and Peter successfully secured the tube, and upon opening it, they found it crammed full of complex mathematical formulas. Peter turns to his dad and asks, what is all this stuff he's written? Dr. Walter is at a loss for words, embarrassed, admitting that he didn't understand it either. Deciding to return to the lab for a detailed examination, they are interrupted by Henrietta, who mentions a friend who wishes to meet them. It's Philip. The old friends reunite, and it's a moment filled with deep emotion. Philip reveals that the moment he saw Henrietta, he knew she was their daughter, so he kept her safe. She also taught him how to conceal his thoughts. Suddenly, the observers are hot on their trail. These people are like bad pennies always turning up. Urged to disperse quickly, the group says goodbye to Philip and dashes into a warehouse. They are vastly outnumbered by the enemy and fight while on the run. But in the chaos, Henrietta gets separated and captured by the observer leader. He tries to read her mind and learns only that she's Peter and Olivia's child. In a cruel twist, the bald leader kills Henrietta, delivering a gut-wrenching blow to the plot. Just a short while into their reunion, the family is torn apart by life and death, leaving Peter and Olivia devastated. Peter, in a rage for his daughter, vows to stop at nothing until he takes down the bald leader. Olivia is more fearful having already lost Henrietta. In these turbulent times, she worries that Peter might be next. Clutching Henrietta's necklace, they prepare to avenge their daughter. The camera cuts to a street where a phenomenon of static electricity discharge occurs. Then, an observer, accompanied by a host of underlings, places a mysterious cube on the street. Upon activation, a portal opens in the air, and three white boxes emerge. The observer scans them and declares there are no problems, signaling for them to be transported away. 
In the next scene, Astrid calls to say that the digging for the videotapes must be postponed. This is because Dr. Walter placed a bottle of acetylene, which is used for cooking eggs, right next to the next videotape. If the laser used to retrieve it were to shake even slightly, there'd be an explosion leaving nothing but chicken feathers. So, like delicate archaeological work, they must proceed with the utmost care and patience. At this moment, Henrietta's colleague and fellow resistance fighter, the tech expert, arranges a meetup. He takes the group to the street where the incident occurred and explains that the observers have created a wormhole from the future to the present to transport parts for an air control system. The tech expert estimates that after a few more transports, the system will be complete and when operational, it will reduce the human lifespan to 45 years. So disrupting their transport is crucial. The good news is that they captured an observer yesterday who was carrying a mysterious cube and a notebook filled with their proprietary script, which likely contains the time and location of the next shipment. The cube is the device that opens the wormhole, but they're clueless about how to assemble it and hope Peter can help. Peter, full of unresolved anger, decides to assist, but after much tinkering, he's stumped. Dr. Walter then hypothesizes that if one end of the wormhole is blocked, everything would plummet downwards, creating a black hole on the other side that could destroy their entire transport base. But when the wormhole opens, it will surely be heavily guarded, making it difficult to get close. Therefore, they need to devise a way to activate the device and open the wormhole in advance. Peter decides to interrogate the captured observer. Olivia is hesitant to let Peter take the risk, fearful of losing him again. Dr. Walter overhears her concerns. After a brief comfort from Peter, he resolutely proceeds to extract the assembly method from the observer. However, the observer is stubborn and remains silent, constantly using mind-reading techniques, which greatly annoys Peter. Crafting a plan, Peter places a magnifying glass over the observer's eyes. Noticing that pupils contract under stress, he watches the observer's pupils while attempting to assemble the device. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter hands Olivia a box of videotapes, saying, These are recordings from Henrietta's past birthdays and she should watch them. Olivia responds she is afraid she won't be able to handle it. Dr. Walter insists that she has to remember this love. It's stronger than any bond. This pain is also a gift from Henrietta, proof that she existed in this world. Despite this, Olivia is still reluctant to watch. Meanwhile, Astrid cracks the observer's notebook and discovers that their next shipment is scheduled for the afternoon. Meanwhile, Peter somehow manages to fully assemble the device. He then takes it to the designated location and activates it before the observers have a chance. Upon seeing the device in action, the observers realize something is amiss. Someone has been meddling. In an instant, they spot Peter and Olivia. But before any confrontation can occur, Peter fires at the wormhole, successfully sealing it. He then waits for the observers to be sucked into a black hole. But to his bafflement, the observers continue transporting goods as if unaffected. Something is clearly not right. Fuming, Peter confronts the observer, only to discover that his assembly was indeed incorrect. The observer nonchalantly mentions that his pupils only contracted upon seeing a disgusting fly, not due to the device's assembly. Peter says their special abilities are just high technology. In a fit of rage, Peter kills the observer and extracts a rod from the back of his neck. Could this be the secret to the observer's power? Curious, Peter decides to insert the rod into his own neck. Just then, Olivia calls. She's watched the videos and longing for Peter, she asks him to come home. The scene shifts to Dr. Walter unearthing another videotape, number seven. In the video, he points to a building stating that they need to find something in room 413. Dr. Walter goes there himself to find the building badly damaged by the observers but not destroyed. In the room, he looks at his cheat sheet and takes strange steps. Suddenly, he dives in and enters a bizarre area that, while still resembling the building, is more like a mirrored maze, an otherworldly labyrinth of his own creation, no doubt containing something vital to his plan. Peter and the others come across the videotape and realize that Dr. Walter has gone off on his own to retrieve something. This pocket universe was created in the gaps between two worlds belonging to neither. Dr. Walter has named it the Pocket Universe. The video also features a man named Donald, whose face is unseen as he is always behind the camera. This mysterious Donald must have had a close relationship with Dr. Walter, assisting him after the observer's invasion. But now Dr. Walter has no memory of him, adding to the enigma. In the video, Dr. Walter meticulously teaches the steps required to enter the Pocket Universe, but the video cuts to black the moment he steps in. As the scene shifts, Dr. Walter wanders aimlessly like a headless fly. Suddenly a man appears and grabs him, ready to attack. Dr. Walter quickly asks if the man is Donald, but he isn't. 
This person was accidentally trapped here during the observer's bombardment. Dr. Walter, eager to escape, tells the man to follow him if he doesn't want to leave on his own. The man, now Dr. Walter's reluctant sidekick, reveals he's been stuck here for several days and fears he'll starve if they don't find a way out soon. Dr. Walter is stunned. The observer's attack happened 20 years ago. It seems that a day here could be the equivalent of several years outside. Meanwhile, Peter and two others arrive at room 413 and follow the steps shown in the video, which leads them into the pocket universe. Astrid stays behind to keep watch. To their astonishment, they discover that the video contains more content that can only be viewed from within the pocket universe. Following Dr. Walter's instructions, they realize that this place is riddled with secret passages. Elsewhere, the observers check the surveillance and discover a group's whereabouts and report it to their leader. At this moment, Olivia and her team find Dr. Walter and the two parties converge. Dr. Walter exclaims in admiration for her bringing the camera. Then, a bald child appears in the recording. Indeed, it's the same child with telekinetic powers they had rescued from a secret room in Season 1. Following the video, they arrive at a row of rooms marked with various symbols. These symbols represent the set and scene transitions of the show. Dr. Walter leads the boy into a room marked with an apple embryo symbol and tells him to wait there for someone to find him. It turns out this boy is the key they've been searching for and is part of their plan. Upon entering the room, they find it empty, but there's a radio on the table that wasn't in the video. With no other choice, they take the radio and plan their next move. The observers catch up and knock out Astrid. The team makes it back to the starting room, and Dr. Walter prepares to retrace their steps. Peter, however, grabs him and throws him out. It seems that he can see the doorway. As they fight to break free from the encircling enemies, Peter tells the others to go ahead while he covers their retreat. He engages in a fight with the observers and, to his surprise, finds he is as powerful as them. He defeats the observer, who warns him that stealing their technology comes at a price. Peter, uninterested, uses a quick move to break the observer's neck. All of this is witnessed by the observer leader, making things more complicated. Peter's intelligence is too high, making him a tough opponent. On their way back, Dr. Walter mentions that his mind seems to have changed ever since Henrietta sent back the three pieces of brain tissue, leading to dark thoughts about destroying the Earth akin to a desire for Genesis. He came alone to seek help and insists Peter must keep an eye on him to prevent him from going astray. Unbeknownst to them, Peter is also undergoing changes. He can now see the future and appears distracted as he constantly calculates different outcomes. Apparently, he is planning to avenge his daughter, Henrietta. Back in the lab, Olivia notices something off about Peter, but he keeps it to himself, preparing to act alone. They then uncover tape number five, adding it to the previously found tapes. In the video, Dr. Walter mentions going to Dr. Bell's old lab to retrieve two metal eggs, used by the observers as beacons for time travel. Access to the lab requires Dr. Bell's palm print, which explains why they needed Dr. Bell's hand and thus cut it off. Dr. Walter is puzzled about how bad Dr. Bell is connected again. Astrid explains that after the invasion began, Dr. Bell approached Dr. Walter, offering to bury the hatchet and help. They teamed up once more, but in the end, Dr. Bell betrayed everyone. Peter adds that when the observers suddenly showed up, he suspected Dr. Bell had turned them in. So in a moment of desperation, he decided to encase everyone in amber. Upon arriving at Dr. Bell's lab, they discovered the main door was obstructed by a huge boulder. Olivia suddenly noticed that Peter's ear was bleeding. Peter brushed it off, saying, It's really nothing. He had a few days like this each month, and his symptoms just weren't consistent. They all agreed to ask Nina for help. At that moment, Peter made an excuse to leave the group. Naturally, he was off to stir up trouble with the observers. Nina mentioned that the observer's invention, a substance sublimator, might be useful. This machine could vaporize solids directly. Peter then sought out the tech expert, who remarked that the whole situation isn't quite as he described. He said the observer would take the wrong briefcase, but that didn't happen. Peter realized that variables had changed and he needed to predict again. After peering into the future, he took the briefcase and stashed it in a pub. Dr. Walter confides in Nina about his feeling of turning evil. Nina suggests that if he is scared, they will remove his brain after this is all over. Dr. Walter disagrees, claiming he has his son Peter, who loves and cares for him, will prevent him from turning bad. He's afraid that he'll become foolish if she removes his brain now. Nina warns him that love isn't a sure safeguard, citing her own love for Dr. Bell, which didn't stop him from turning bad. 
Dr. Walter, in denial, tells Nina not to flatter herself and that Dr. Bell never loved her, a comment that deeply wounds Nina. Elsewhere, an observer takes a briefcase and meets with two others in a building. Upon opening it, all three melt instantly. It was the bioweapon from the first episode on the plane. The briefcase was actually prepared by Peter, who had switched it with the observers at the pub, a move calculated from his visions of the future. Peter concocted a flawless lie to deceive Olivia. Despite no obvious flaws in his story, Olivia had a nagging feeling that something about Peter was off. Previously, in the pocket universe, Peter could see the exit directly. Using the substance sublimator, they vaporized the boulder at the lab's entrance, successfully gaining entry and scanning Dr. Bell's palm print, only to find no metal eggs, just a small disc and Nina's photo. Dr. Walter's anxiety spiked, and he wondered if Dr. Bell truly loved Nina, and if so, it seems nothing can prevent his turning evil, not even his son Peter. Suddenly, the disc began to flash, and two metal eggs emerged from the ground. After seizing the metal eggs, Peter departed without a word once more. Dr. Walter handed over the photo he found to Nina and earnestly pleaded with her to extract his brain tissue once everything was over. In the evening, Olivia returned home to find a transparent board filled with the Observer's timelines. Peter appeared and confessed that he possessed Observer technology. He revealed that he had executed three men of the Observer leader today, and the next step would be to take out the leader himself. After saying this, Peter began to calculate incessantly, leaving Olivia feeling a wave of despair. She quietly left, feeling that Peter was becoming more distant and elusive. As Peter touched his head, a lot of his hair fell out. After learning that Peter has implanted Observer's technology, Olivia asks the tech expert to buy one on the black market, intending to take it back for research. The scene switches back to Peter, still scribbling away in the house, plotting to kill the Observer leader. However, the leader has already located Peter and is on his way there. Peter, having anticipated everything, is not caught off guard. Dr. Walter digs out videotape number eight, which instructs them to retrieve an industrial magnet from a junkyard. At this point, Olivia presents the Observer's device to Dr. Walter and informs everyone about Peter's actions. Dr. Walter plans to install it in the brain of a porcupine creature to study how it works. Olivia volunteers to undertake the task of retrieving the magnet. Upon arriving at the designated junkyard, the woman in charge there tells her she's been waiting for Olivia. She explains that shortly after the invasion began, a person with gray-white hair asked her mother to safeguard this magnet until someone came for it. This task seemed quite straightforward. As the camera shifts, the device is automatically absorbed into the porcupine creature's brain. Moments later, the creature's neural activity multiplies several times. They simulate the brain's future changes, which will develop a new spine, and the cerebral cortex will thicken. Logical neurons will take over the emotional ones, meaning if Peter continues on this path, he will become an emotionless, purely calculating machine. Peter is still out on the streets, continuously calculating, but let's not forget that the Observer leader can also predict the future. This is a showdown between true masters, and the logic within is beyond our comprehension. Suddenly, the leader appears beside Peter to flex his bald head, and a fight ensues. In the end, Peter escapes, but is injured. Elsewhere, Olivia drives a truck to haul away the magnet. Peter seeks out Dr. Walter to help stitch up his wound. Dr. Walter warns him to know his limits, saying that if he continues like this, both he and Olivia will lose him. Without Peter, Dr. Walter fears he too might lose his mind. But Peter disagrees, insisting on avenging Henrietta. Olivia contacts the tech expert because such a large magnet needs a special place to be stored. The tech expert finds a warehouse for temporary storage. Suddenly their path is blocked by two vehicles. It turns out to be bandits who, after scanning with their device, learn that Olivia is a fugitive with a hefty bounty on her head. They decide to hand her over to the observers to ensure their own safety rather than continue being bandits. Olivia is captured by the two bandits, but they are naive to think they can hold her sexy body. After all, she has learned a great deal from Dr. Walter, becoming exceptionally skilled in physics and chemistry. She crafts a high-voltage emitter, loads Henrietta's keepsake bullet into a tube, and kills one of the bandits. After picking up his gun, she kills the other one and then retrieves Henrietta's bullet from the wall. It's her daughter's keepsake, and she can't afford to lose it. At night, Peter is intently observing the Observer leader. Olivia finds him, and Peter points out the steps, saying if the leader climbs them, it will confirm he's entered the timeline Peter has arranged. Without any mishaps, he'll be able to kill him by tomorrow afternoon and avenge their daughter. Olivia responds that by tomorrow afternoon, he might not even remember her or even forget who Henrietta is. 
She asks what the point is if that happens. She reminds him that their daughter is still with them. Her bullet even saved Olivia's life that day. Peter claims emotions are their weakness, but Olivia corrects him. Emotions are their strength. The observers can do anything except feel emotions, which is the one thing they lack. She doesn't need him to avenge Henrietta, nor does she want Henrietta erased from their memory. She pleads with him to come back. Peter is then reminded of all the moments he shared with Olivia and finally comes to a realization. He removes the device from his head with a knife. After a good long sleep, he felt much better, but the same couldn't be said for Dr. Walter. His dark thoughts were becoming more severe, to the point where he actually considered defecting to the observers, just to indulge in the thrill brought on by their supreme scientific technology. As a result, he took a large dose of hallucinogens in an attempt to numb himself. At that moment, Astrid made a surprising discovery. The radio, which had been set to a fixed frequency, was broadcasting a sound. It seemed to be transmitting a code that needed to be deciphered. It appeared that only Dr. Walter could crack this code, but he was no longer lucid, starting to see hallucinations. Among them were fairies, and astonishingly, a woman. She was Dr. Walter's female assistant, the one who died in a great fire. She consistently urged Dr. Walter to let go, to release his self-control in layman's terms, to turn into a bad boy. That's when Olivia had a stroke of genius. She said they didn't need to decode the message at all. They could simply find the source of the signal. So they enlisted the tech expert's help and using triangulation tracked down the origin of the signal. Peter and Olivia, with the tracker in hand, approached the source of the signal. While they were investigating, they were suddenly overcome by a wave of emotion and ended up wrestling their juicy tongues. This smelly kiss led to a discovery akin to finding a new world. Olivia found an abandoned car surrounded by the bodies of observers. There was also a man in the car. Peter suspected it was Donald, but he realized that this wasn't a signal transmitter but a transceiver. It was receiving signals from another location and then relaying them to the radio, acting like a relay station. Olivia found a wallet on the man and upon opening it, confirmed his identity. It was Dr. Sam, which was strange because on this timeline he shouldn't have known the two of them. Moreover, it seemed like he was protecting the radio transmitter and had died fighting the observers, both sides perishing together. Back in the lab, the hallucination of the female assistant kept prompting Dr. Walter to search for something, claiming it was his life's work and secret. Then Nina's apparition also appeared, urging Dr. Walter not to do it. They were like an angel and a devil to him. But in the end, Dr. Walter found the item the female assistant spoke of. It was a notebook containing his research findings. Only then did the assistant reveal the reason she was burnt to death. She had committed suicide to destroy that very notebook. Dr. Walter, unable to resist, opened it to take a look. As the scene changes, he's sitting in a taxi, giving his notebook a good look over. It's filled with sketches of his high-tech inventions. Then suddenly a word, black umbrella, pops into his mind. But for some reason, he can't fathom why this word just sprang to mind. Just then, an observer tries to open the door. This could spell trouble, but it's all just a hallucination to him. The real him is being escorted by others to the true source of the signal. They take a small boat to an island. The vision of his female assistant keeps appearing due to the potent drugs. They track the signal to a house. It turns out the child observer has been living there. 20 years have passed, and he hasn't aged a bit. Frankly, they're told they need a password to take him away, but no one besides Dr. Walter can crack it. So, Dr. Walter begins his dreamlike deduction and finally figures it out. The answer is Black Umbrella. It turns out the two elderly folks have always been resistors. One day, Donald suddenly appears and hands the child over to the couple, instructing them to wait for a scientist and to send out a signal every five days. Unexpectedly, after 20 years, someone finally arrives. The child observer is called Michael. Olivia asks if he remembers her, and Michael nods in acknowledgement. Peter is puzzled. On this timeline, he shouldn't recognize either of them. But then they figure, observers have a different concept of time. Anything can be explained away. Dr. Walter's drug-induced state hasn't worn off yet. He's still torn between the angel and the devil. He decides to burn his notebook, but its contents are already etched in his brain. This means that the evil Dr. Walter is becoming clearer by the minute. They bring Michael back to the lab and discover he doesn't have the observer's special tech installed, not even a scar. Nobody knows why he is so extraordinary. No matter what they ask, he just won't talk. Olivia asks him to write backwards to communicate with her like he did before, but he still doesn't respond. Olivia then calls Nina again. Nina says she'll get in touch later. It's not safe to talk right now. 
After a while, the Observer leader and his crew show up at the door. It turns out the Observers have discovered that the substance sublimator used by Olivia and the others was provided by Massive Dynamic. So, they come to ask some questions. Conveniently, Nina just stepped out. They eavesdrop on the vibrations on the glass and learn that the child observer has been found. This is definitely not good news. The camera cuts to Nina, who reveals that Massive Dynamic has a secret lab, a place where they dissect and study observers. This lab houses a thought-reading device which might prove useful, so they make their way to the lab, intending to fit Michael with the reader. At the same time, the Observer leader decides he'll read the minds of his crew, hoping to uncover any leads. As the scene shifts again, Nina projects Michael's thoughts onto a computer, only to find them unreadable. His level of thinking has surpassed that of humanity by hundreds of millions of years. It seems the only way to understand is to enter his mind, but that means they'll need another thought reader. There's stock in the massive dynamic warehouse, and the trio decides to go for it. Nina recalls Dr. Sam, who helped them acquire the substance generator. He knows the place. Olivia tries calling Dr. Sam, but gets no response because he's lined up for interrogation. With no other choice, they have to go themselves. They get Astrid to remotely control and crack the password lock. Meanwhile, Dr. Sam, having never trained in mind shield techniques, is detained without uttering a word, and so the observers also learn that Nina is a resistor. The trio locates the thought reader in the warehouse. Concurrently, Olivia learns that the Observer Leader is interrogating Dr. Sam, so she urgently contacts Nina, urging her to extract Michael quickly. At the same time, followers trace Nina's signal, a concerning development. Nina prepares to retreat with Michael, but suddenly he touches her face in a reversing gesture, and inexplicably, Nina is spellbound, wearing an expression of complete fulfillment. The Observer Leader tracked down the lab, only to find Nina hadn't fled at all. Instead, she was calmly waiting for them to arrive. As for Michael, his whereabouts were unknown. The leader, upon seeing them dissecting an observer, exclaimed that their actions were downright bestial. Nina retorted that although the observers have evolved impressively, with high IQs, quick reflexes, and strong logic, they lack emotion. In their evolution, all they've managed to acquire are the traits that humans have discarded, like apes, snakes, or even grasshoppers. It's hard to say who the real beasts are. The leader, impatient, demanded she cut the crap and tell him where the child observer is. He added that this boy is a mutated species who was meant to be discarded but was stolen instead. Nina, without a word, pulled out a gun and took her own life, challenging him to read her dead mind. The trio returned to the lab to a tragic scene, finding another comrade had fallen. They found Michael hidden in the lab, tears streaming down his face, a sign that he also possessed emotions. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter donned the thought reader and managed to communicate simply with Michael, who found the device bothersome, and with a coy touch, caressed Dr. Walter's cheek. Consequently, Michael's memories from a previous timeline returned, recalling all that had to do with Peter. Moreover, he saw September and Donald, and realized that Donald was actually September, just with hair. In the evening, Dr. Walter told Peter that he had a way to find September, also known as Donald. What Michael showed Dr. Walter was his deeply buried subconscious. To delve into this part of his sensory subconscious, a sensory deprivation tank was the best option. So Dr. Walter submerged himself in the tank, and Olivia peeked in, asking, What's that down there? Dr. Walter replied that he took off his trunks too. It allows for the release of self, making him feel utterly free. The effect is much better this way. Olivia was taken aback, wondering if freedom means letting his small thing swim on its own. She said once he had enough freedom, they would get started. As Dr. Walter entered the subconscious state, he arrived at September's abode and took in the surrounding scenery. Based on Dr. Walter's descriptions, Astrid pinpointed the general area. Dr. Walter urged them to hurry to find September. It seemed that ever since Michael had touched him, Dr. Walter was filled with a zest for life, much like when Michael touched Nina. The scene shifts and the Observer Leader arrives in the year 2609 because his superiors want to see him. It turns out he isn't the top commander after all. Michael's emergence seems to have the higher-ups particularly on edge. Back to the trio, they set off to find September. On their way, Peter asks his father, what's got into him since he seems like a chicken on steroids? Dr. Walter responds he doesn't know what it is, but he's sure he won't turn bad. That touch from Michael made him feel like all his past scientific experiments are worthless. 
What's important is that he remembers the times he had with Peter, and that's what he should cherish. The two share a tight embrace. Peter asks if he recalls anything about the plan since he can now remember things from the previous timeline, but Dr. Walter shakes his head. They hesitated at the door upon arrival, not daring to open it. It had been 20 years, and there was no telling whether September was still there. To their surprise, when they finally opened the door, he was indeed there. Not only had he become more human-like, but he had also aged considerably. September explained everything. It turned out that due to his multiple interventions in the timeline, he had been disciplined by the organization. As punishment, the device implanted in his body was removed, and over time, he became more like a normal human, understanding love, hate, and all human emotions. So when he learned of the Observer's impending invasion, he decided to help humanity. He also mentioned that in the future year 2167, a scientist discovered he could increase human intelligence at the expense of their emotions. This very invention led to the creation of the observers. Without emotions, they would certainly not engage in physical procreation. Hence, they developed a method of asexual reproduction using genetic material. The process of reproduction was one where emotions gradually faded and intellect progressively increased. However, during the process, Michael mutated. He stopped growing halfway, which is why he became a special observer with the abilities of an observer, but without the loss of emotions. Therefore, the organization decided to terminate him. September suddenly felt a fatherly instinct to protect his child and decided to take him back to the past to hide him, leading to their discovery of him in the secret room. It turned out that Michael was created using September's DNA, making him September's son in a way. It was initially thought that his abilities might not match those of an adult observer, but in reality, he was even more powerful. September then detailed a plan to defeat the observers. Apparently, the moment the future scientist invented the observers was a critical turning point. If Michael could be brought to that moment so the scientist could see him, he would realize that high intelligence could be achieved without erasing human emotions, thus preventing the birth of the observers and consequently their invasion. September said that everything they had gathered was for assembling a time travel machine, which would also require future scientific technology, a technology he had brought back from the future and hidden somewhere. Olivia told Peter that if time travel was possible, then their daughter Henrietta might be resurrected. Upon reflection, Peter realized that might indeed be the case. The scene shifts, and the bald leader gets a severe reprimand from his superiors, instructing him to continue the capture operation. After conducting an investigation, he tracks down September. Having reviewed September's file, he uses the GPS implanted in September to find his home. By the time he arrives, everyone has already left. He finds September's GPS in the house, indicating that September had anticipated his arrival. September retrieves the time travel technology he had stored in a warehouse. At this moment, Dr. Walter informs September that when Michael touched him, he conveyed two things that he hadn't shared with anyone else. The first was that after September saved two people from Reedon Lake and said one of them was very important and must be watched, he wasn't referring to Peter, but to Michael. The second realization was that the plan would require September to sacrifice himself. This is why Michael restored September's memories of the timeline so he could die contented. Dr. Walter confesses that, to be honest, he's a bit scared. September asks him if he remembers receiving a tulip once, a reference to season two, reminding him that before the plan, it was that very tulip that kept him going. Dr. Walter looks but finds nothing in the envelope and becomes anxious about finding the tulip, his moral support. September suggests that he might have hidden it somewhere only he would know. After bidding everyone farewell, September says he still has to prepare some things. The group heads back but encounters a strict search by the followers. They barely manage to board a train thinking they're finally safe, only to discover the followers are conducting a search. Michael decisively gets off the train, drawing their attention, and helps the three others escape successfully, but he ends up being captured by the observer leader. Without the boy, the plan cannot proceed. So Olivia urgently contacts Philip, who learns from a follower the location where Michael is being held, a secret base underneath the Statue of Liberty in New York. The scene shifts again, unexpectedly revealing that the Statue of Liberty has been bombed to nothing but its pedestal. The observer leader decides to interrogate Michael, but fails to get anything from him. Instead, Michael leaves him bleeding profusely from all orifices. It seems they have greatly underestimated Michael's capabilities, and the bald leader, now intimidated, refrains from further questioning and instead orders a full medical examination of Michael. Inside the lab, Philip made a call, providing the precise location of Michael, along with a blueprint. 
The defense system here is incredibly tight, with layers upon layers of security, so much so that not even a mosquito could get through. Suddenly, Olivia had a flash of inspiration. He suggested that they might take a roundabout way to save the day. Since the Department of Defense in the parallel world is located within the Statue of Liberty, if they could cross over from there into the primary world, they might bypass the defense systems and get straight in. However, there were two problems. First, the last time on Dr. Bell's Noah's Ark, Olivia had nearly depleted the cortexaphin in her body for resurrection, and crossing over would require another injection, the side effects of which were unknown. Second, after 20 years, no one knew what state the parallel world would be in. It might even have been invaded by the observers. Olivia suggested they take a peek through the peephole window to get an idea of the situation. When they arrived at Liberty Island in New York, they used the peephole and saw that the bronze-colored Statue of Liberty in the parallel world was still intact, with pedestrians walking around as usual, indicating that the parallel world was seemingly normal. Switching scenes, September gathered many parts necessary for the plan and arrived at the lab, only to find it deserted. He was unaware that Michael had been captured. To save time, he had no choice but to start assembling the time travel device by himself. Elsewhere, the group arrives at the resistance base to inject Olivia with cortexaphin. After just one shot, Olivia felt weakened. Dr. Walter explained that one shot wouldn't suffice. It would take four, as she needed to cross over four times, and without the full dosage, she might not be able to return. Why four times? Let's do the math. First, Olivia would cross from the primary world to the parallel. Then, she would cross from the Statue of Liberty in the parallel world to its counterpart in the primary one. After finding Michael, they would cross back to the parallel world, and finally, after emerging from the statue and reaching a safe zone, they would cross back to the primary world. In another shift, after the observers conducted a comprehensive diagnosis on Michael, they discovered he was an almost divine being. Olivia found a safe area and managed to cross over to the parallel world. As expected, the fringe division in this world still existed and detected this unusual space-time rift, sending someone to capture Olivia immediately. Unexpectedly, the Olivia from the parallel world had married Agent Lincoln, and their children were already in college. Dr. Walter in this world was 90 years old, retired, and spent his days teaching at Harvard University. Their meeting was filled with emotion. After shutting down the doomsday device, it was the primary world that had started down the path of decline. But they couldn't afford to dwell on this. They had to rescue Michael quickly. So Parallel Olivia and Lincoln personally escorted Olivia to the Statue of Liberty. Meanwhile, September has nearly completed the assembly of the device. He attempts a trial startup, only to discover that the reactor's energy source is insufficient. This is a problem. The year is now 2609. The bald leader reports Michael's diagnosis to his superiors. The response from above is dismissive, saying that since there's something even they can't comprehend, they must stop studying it, just dismantle him. Parallel Olivia and Lincoln take Olivia to the area where Michael might be. She blinks and crosses over to the primary world. Unexpectedly, at that very moment, Michael is being taken away for disassembly. Olivia is forced to search door to door. She finds Michael, who smiles at her as if he knew she would come. Together, they cross back to the parallel world, but the observers are on their heels. With the help of parallel Olivia and Lincoln, Olivia manages to reach a safe zone and then crosses back to the primary to reunite with everyone. The bald leader brings in the informant, and it quickly becomes apparent that Philip is the mole codenamed Pigeon. Meanwhile, September stealthily infiltrates the observer's ranks in search of his former teammate, December. December has taken out the reactor and points out that without power, the time machine can't start. December is aware of what September intends to do and questions him, saying if they proceed, they'll cease to exist. September counters that if they don't act, they will vanish, referring to the current human population. It turns out that the original 12 scientists sent from the future, from January to December, gradually developed emotions, a sense of pity and care for the humans of the past, which they find bewildering and eerie, so they agreed to remain silent about these feelings. The original purpose of their mission was concealed by the higher-ups. It was presented as scientific research, but the actual intent was pre-invasion reconnaissance. Now, with human society in dire straits, September hopes December will give him a reactor to help save humanity. Elsewhere, the Observer leader has his men install surveillance in Philip's car. When everyone returns to the lab, they discover that September has already set up the device. Dr. Walter then gives everyone a detailed rundown of the plan's steps. 
The first step is to use the device to open a wormhole. However, the timing for both ends of the wormhole needs to be calibrated, which is where the two metal eggs come in. The purpose of the metal eggs is to accurately guide the time points. One is set to the year 2167, a pivotal year when future scientists plan to create the observers. The design is based on the formulas found on the paper inside a found scroll. September could use these formulas for the design. The other egg is set to the present, ensuring the wormhole's time alignment is accurate. You can't just toss the metal eggs into the wormhole willy-nilly, which is where industrial magnets come into play. Using the magnet's powerful repulsion, the metal egg designated for 2167 is propelled into the wormhole. Once the wormhole is open, Michael steps in to meet the scientists of 2167. The encounter will inspire the idea that one does not need to forego emotions to achieve high intelligence. This meeting could alter the trajectory of human evolution, making it so the observers never existed. But there's a problem. What if Michael can't find the scientists in 2167? That's why someone needs to guide him, and that someone is Dr. Walter. This means that once he goes back to the future, he can't return. Meanwhile, Philip is on his way to the lab to meet with everyone when he discovers an extra pair of gloves in his car, indicating he's been bugged. Realizing he can't escape, he decides to stall for as long as possible to buy time for the others to evacuate. Peter finds a videotape in a piece of amber, and upon playing it, they discover it's Dr. Walter's last message. He confesses his fear of leaving them, saying he'd rather stay in the lab baking tasteless cakes than go to the future because he cherishes the beautiful times he spent with them, giving him a sense of home. But what he's about to do might bring Henrietta back to life, allowing the family to reunite. And that's something he feels he must do as a father. The two share a tight embrace, bracing for the heartbreaking farewell, moving everyone to tears. Afterward, Astrid and Olivia go to December to initiate the reactor, but they find that December has already taken his own life, and the reactor's whereabouts are unknown. It turns out that December was under constant surveillance by the bald leader. Meanwhile, Philip has been captured, causing the rest to fall into a dire situation. Suddenly, Astrid has an epiphany and suggests that they don't need the device to create a wormhole. Why not use the Observer's cargo passage, which is essentially an existing wormhole? The next opening of this cargo passage is scheduled for tomorrow morning. All they need to do is to steal a mysterious cube before the observers do, and then use it to open the wormhole. Dr. Walter thinks the idea is brilliant. Everyone notifies the Resistance Army, and a flurry of preparation ensues throughout the night. Dr. Walter hands Peter a string of hungry metal bullets that can send the observers flying, a classic fringe event in the series. Suddenly, September approaches Dr. Walter and insists on taking his place, telling him not to sacrifice himself since he has a family, and he will take the task for him instead. Dr. Walter is startled, knowing how hard it was for him to resolve to do this, but September convinces him by highlighting the bond he has seen between Dr. Walter and Peter. The doctor eventually agrees. Before dawn, they decide to strike, catching the enemy off guard. They've crafted a poison gas bomb with elements that left a lasting impression throughout the previous four seasons, such as virus parasites, hair loss parasites, and potent hallucinogens. Olivia, monitoring the situation, discovers that Philip is unharmed. It turns out that his room lacks a ventilation system, so the poison gas couldn't penetrate it. After they steal the mysterious cube, they rescue Philip en route and then head to the designated location to set up the wormhole. The observers arrive, engaging in a final, desperate battle with the Resistance Army. September uses the cube to open the wormhole, and Dr. Walter uses magnets to launch a metal egg into it. All they need to do next is guide Michael through. But the bald leader appears, intent on killing Michael. Peter disrupts the leader, and more observers arrive, knocking both Olivia and Peter to the ground, but they don't finish them off. Suddenly the sky changes and the entire city loses power. A truck appears out of nowhere and unexpectedly ends the leader's bald life, an act presumably triggered by Michael's special abilities. September prepares to take Michael through the wormhole, but is tragically shot and falls, mortally wounded. Heartbroken, Michael gently winds the music box September gave him, playing a farewell tune. With September dead, the task of escorting Michael falls back to Dr. Walter. It should be noted that this escort mission can only be carried out by them, as time travel isn't for just anyone. It requires a special vaccine, and only the two of them have been vaccinated. With a heavy heart, and amidst the sad farewells of his companions, Dr. Walter resolutely steps into the wormhole with Michael. The scene shifts to some time later when Peter and his family of three are enjoying a day out in the park. It seems that the plan was a success, and the timeline has been rewritten once again. 
In this new timeline, the observers never appeared. One day, Peter receives a letter from Dr. Walter. Inside the envelope is a hand-drawn tulip, a white tulip, symbolizing something beautiful that remains so even after being altered. It's also what Dr. Walter has longed for, a sign from God. This is the biggest mystery left by the series. Why is there a letter from Dr. Walter? Since Dr. Walter managed to send this letter, he must exist in this timeline, and there's no reason for him not to. After all, they only altered the Observer's evolutionary process. The intersection of the Observer's and Dr. Walter occurred at the time when Dr. Walter inadvertently intervened while inventing the cure to save Peter. Peter has already died in this primary world. Parallel Walter has successfully developed the cure and saved Peter. So if Peter appears in the primary world, it must still be Dr. Walter who brought him back from the parallel world. But the significance of this act is different from before. The last time it was about salvation, but this time he brought back a Peter who had already been saved, thus increasing his sense of guilt and his need for God's redemption, that white tulip. From the look in Peter's eyes, it's clear he may just be realizing that he comes from the parallel world. With that, season five of this drama concludes. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.